Today's episode of In the Trenches is brought to you by System 12 Guitar Method. Sign up today at RyanRoxy.com. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of In the Trenches. I am your host, Ryan Roxy. What is happening, everybody, as you file into that live chat? Um... We are on the YouTube official channel. That is our home. Although you might be listening to us on an audio broadcast, I appreciate that as well. Or you're listening to us on Facebook Live. It's the YouTube channel, the Ryan Roxy YouTube channel, where I really want you uh, to subscribe and be part of it, part of this live chat. In fact, so much so that Vic, our producer, just put up that subscribe button right there. Hit that subscribe button so you can be a part of our podcast every single week. Um, yeah, I have a different type of uh, backdrop, don't I, today? I'm not in the studio because I'm out on the road. I'm out on the road with Alice Cooper and the boys and the girl, and those are our dates right now. Um, wow. Okay. A couple sold-out shows right there. We just started. We got two under our belts. We played the London O2 uh, just a couple nights ago, and now I find myself in Manchester, of course. We um, And now I'm just looking at the back. You can see the back of me right there. It's one of those the best like dressing rooms I could actually find because not only does it have ethernet cable, it has this lovely cinder block off white prison cell vibe. So here we are <laughs> very in the trenches like, and um, apparently, yeah, we are all accessing out right now. We are on the European leg number two of the Alice Cooper. If you want to find out about a little bit more about all excess, you can go right to um, ryanroxy.com, but you're here now. And now I'm ready to start the show. Are you? Here we go. I consider today's guest one of the pioneers of shred guitar. I remember seeing his photo in the local LA music magazines all throughout the years that I was cutting my teeth in the trenches, so to speak, you know, doing my best to make guitar playing and guitar driven music more than just a hobby, but a lifestyle. Now this guy proved that in order to give, to get your head above the crowd, Perhaps you need more than just one neck. That's a little foreshadowing there for you, right? Will you welcome into the trenches one of Rock's most unique and special players, Michael Angelo Badio? Hello, Michael. Hey, hey Ryan. Ryan, how are you? It's great. We've out throughout all these years of living in Los Angeles, playing rock and roll, playing guitar driven music, we have never officially met until and had a conversation until right now. Yeah, it's true. And it's funny because, you know, I've met Nita before and I've, I've jammed with Glenn and, you know, I know people around, but you and I have never met, but I've known about you for, for a while, you know, but it's, so it's great to finally meet. Even it's great to finally meet you you're as well, interested. man. <laughs> well, I, I, I told the crowd where I'm at right now because I'm in Manchester, UK. Uh, we're playing a show. You said that you loved Manchester. You love the UK. Uh, where are you coming to us from? I'm in the Chicago area, like the northern suburbs. That's uh, my hometown. And, you know, like we were talking earlier, I lived in L.A. for a long time. I mean, that's how I got signed. That's how I, I you know, made my career. But, you know, as I got older, uh, you know, my family's here. So I moved back to Chicago and I, I like it. You know, it's you know, it's well, not it Los Angeles, but I'm always out there. So no complaints. Well, it all started in Chicago, so that's why we like to go back to get forward. And that's where we start our show. Cool. Right on, Vic. That's some good. That's our producer right there being right on point. Look at him. And he's not at home either. So he's not in Arkansas right now. He's at an undisclosed a cabin somewhere in the middle of the, of the U.S. So we've got a very international show today, folks, as we do every single week. But Chicago is where it all started for you. Um, yes. What what were the bands? What was the, the inspiration for the guitar in the first place growing up? there? I mean, for me, sh Chicago's got such amazing, great music that has come out of it over the years. But what was it? Well, there you go. That's a oh, nice Gibson amp right at, there. At around 11 years old. Look, at that's a Tysco guitar and a Gibson Skylark amp. And oh, I don't have either of those, but I'd like to acquire them. But I have, a, you know, I collect guitars and I have a lot of the instruments 
that I used to play when I was a kid, like a Fender Mustang, you know, 60s. And, uh, but, <laughs> you know, I loved guitar. And here, here's how it started for me. My mom played piano and even the accordion. And I used to watch her play when I was a kid. And she played this one old song. It's, it was a song. I don't even know where it came from. Yeah, my mom. And, a nice and, and it's called you. My Wild Irish Rose. And like, do, do, I can hear it like five, three, three, two, one, <laughs> one, seven, you know, six, five. And, and I remember being a kid and watching her play it and figuring it out because my ear heard these notes. And, and so I was. You heard, the, you I heard started, the intervals. I heard the intervals. I, I don't know. There was just, you know, I think. I, there was something about the music that I, I understood what she was doing. And I watched her courting. I figured out the song, but, and I played piano for about five years. I didn't take lessons. I just learned by ear. And, but when I was 10, the music that I started to like was heavy. I, I heard distortion guitars and, and I said, well, you can't do this on piano. You know, I couldn't get that kind of sound. So I switched to guitar. And nice. uh, from 10 years old on, guitar's been my main instrument. Keyboards is a secondary instrument for me, but I always play it, but I don't, I don't like to feature it. You know, yeah. I, I like to be known as a guitarist and that plays other instruments, but not the, the, you know, the player of many. But I think at one point, your uh, experience with the piano has enabled you to be dexterous with both hands, which eventually has sort of helped with a bit of your trademark, which is multi necks. And, and I, and again, when I would see you in the LA area on, in all the music magazines, whether it was BAM magazine or music connection, um, you, you had two guitar necks, but right. then I was just dropped a bombshell <laughs> that it be two became four at one point. And then, so we're going to talk about that, but there it is, the classic, uh, the classic Michelangelo Badio um, uh, guitar of the two yes. necks, but we'll get into the four neck in just a bit. But again, starting with the name Badio, growing up in Chicago, is, isn't it, it's the Chicago sounds a little like Batio. It sounds like a little bit of more of an Italian thing. So yeah. why is it, why is it Badio? Yeah, it's that, it's a great question, and actually, no one's ever asked me that. But it's it's it is a great question because my dad's side is Italian, and so in Italy, everybody, you know, Mister Battio, and and my grandfather came over from Sicily. He was Sicilian, and so uh, he used the the official name is Battio, and my mom is is German, a German Czech. So I'm half and half. So, uh, but when we were kids. Um, my dad always said Badio. And I asked him why one day. And he goes, that's the way your grandfather said it. And my <laughs> grandfather passed away when I was a baby. So I actually never met him. Uh, but, I, you know, I look kind of similar to him. Like he had, you know, you think of all Italians as really dark. Where he had blue eyes. And, you know, I inherited that. My dad, neither one of my parents had blue eyes. But I do. It's kind of a recessive trait. But it, I think it just simply he wanted to make it sound more American. You know, like Batio, it's so, you know, ethnic Italian. And I don't know Batio, but I like the sound of it. it. Like, I used to like it when I was a kid. You know, Batio just sounded mean. And, and has and, it always uh, been Batio? Because, I mean, I remember in Los Angeles, it was Michelangelo. Now, have you always had the last name Batio attached to it? or Well, you know, it's funny you mention that because for a while, I, I when I moved out to L.A. in the mid-80s, I got signed with a band called Holland to Atlantic Records. It was my first major record deal. And at that time, yes. And, and uh, that's now that's a picture of us in the 90s. And, and uh, one of our promo shots, we did a reunion, but we had the record produced by Tom Werman and, and Dwayne Barron, who, you know, did uh, Quiet Riot's first album. And Tom Werman you know, did all my favorite uh, Cheap Trick records yeah. and, and Motley Crue as well. And yes. And exactly. And I, my, the first album I went by Mike Badio, that's what I was known in Chicago. And then this was kind of, this was how I changed it to Angelo. It's my middle name. And I was hanging out. I don't mean to drop names, but I was hanging out with CC DeVille. And that's a good name drop. Yeah. Like it, it's, we were at the bow, you know, cause everybody was at the bow and, and the all at the ra the rainbow bar and grill friends. Well, that's what he said. He goes, Hey, you know, I was, uh, I was, we were at this house and I, I play piano 
And I used to use my intimidation arpeggio. I had this thing I would go, the first thing I do on piano, I was like, okay. And, and so, and, and I did it. And he goes, he looks at me, he goes, hey, Michelangelo, let's get the hell out of here. You know, and, and, uh, and so I thought, Shh, you know, that's great. You know, he didn't even know it was my middle name. So I changed it to Angelo, but here's, here's where it got weird. In the early 2000s, when the internet really was exploding, you know, YouTube, you know, Napster thing had already been over, you know, everything, you know, this drastic change. I had a mail order business and, and, and I, it was really successful. I was selling CDs, DVDs, because I was touring so much. So and I had a guitar a, course as well, right? I remember it was a, a lot of guitar lessons, your guitar yes. course. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I worked with Metal Method forever. And so anyway, I start getting hate mail. So these guys, I'm getting these emails going, dude, we bought your album, bro, and you suck, dude. I'm like, what? And, 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 and like people are saying I suck, they're ready. And I, and I, I go, well, what, what album don't you like of mine? I didn't have that many out at the time. And, and me, well, actually, when I take that back, it was 2000s. Yeah, I did. I had like 10 <laughs> albums. So I, I forget that last one. And I go, which one? And, and they said like Live in Saganash. I'm like, I never released an album called Live in Saganash. So Sounds we like went online. And Michelangelo looked. out there. Yes, there's another guy. And so mm -hmm. I had my attorney send him a cease and desist. His attorney sends my attorney back a letter and say, you cease and desist. And, and my attorney, Glenn, who was one of my guitar students, he's one of my best friends. He's a big time intellectual properties attorney. And he, call, he calls me, he's like, Mike, we got a problem. He goes, you're going to have to change your name. I go, what are you talking about? <laughs> we Glenn? told him to stop. And then they told us to stop. Yes. And, and his, <laughs> his last name is Angelo. And he's older than me and was using the name longer. And, ah. and I'm like, oh, man. And so here's yeah. what we did. I was uh, I had just signed again with Dean Guitars and Dean Zielinski, the founder, not the owner, but the guy from the 70s. He was really great at marketing. I go, Dean, what am I going to do? He goes, oh, it's easy. He goes, people know you as Michelangelo. Keep it. He goes, just add your last name. And he goes, then the people like from Chicago knew you as Mike Badio, he goes, you get the best of both. So that's how I, think that I had to add Badio for a legal reason. It was I crazy. I love <laughs> that story. Do you think that Dean Guitars, maybe the owner there uh, had a problem with Jimmy Dean Sausage at one point and they had the same sort of thing? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have no idea. I'm completely speculating on no, that. No, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, even uh, Dean and Washburn, you know, with Dime, because I knew Dime and that, uh, you know, they were both making the ML, even though Dean, the original owner, actually never trademarked the ML design and Washburn had made it longer than the original Dean. So there was a wow. big war going on. But the owner of Dean that passed away, Elliot, was really sharp. And what he did was he talked to the owner of Washburn and he said, look it, we can be in court forever and go back and forth or let's both make it. And, and he actually, they agreed. They said it was really cool. Both Washburn and Dean could make the same guitar, you know, obviously different, little different headstock. But the thing is, uh, Dean was able to outmarket Washburn, you yeah, know, because when Dime got, got murdered, that was so terrible. I mean, and, uh, but, but Dean kind of got Dime's name back with Dean more than Washburn. But it was a really, I thought it was a really great way to avoid a huge legal problem for both company. And, and being that you've been associated with Dean for so many years and now, um, he, he did unfortunately pass away about three or four years ago. You have uh, moved on to another company, which uh, you are proudly displaying right in back of you, uh, Sawtooth, right? Yeah. You know, I, when, when Elliot died, this was actually he passed away, believe it or not. It's a long time now. It's five years ago. And in 2016, he was really sick. And, you know, when I left Dean, um, I, I had worked with this music store in LA called Go DPS Music. And I did a, a workshop there. And I'll never forget, it was a Dean workshop. They were a Dean dealer. And I go into the store and there's only like 20 or 30 chairs set up. I'm like, well, this is not going to be such a big clinic today. And I, you know, I'm not, I didn't get bummed about it, but I just, you know, you walk in, you, you see only a limited amount of chairs. So I'm thinking this thing's going to be just a very small gathering. And all of a sudden, the video cameras come up. And this is the first time. This is around, I don't know. That they streamed something. Okay. Yeah, it, this was the first time I'd ever realized 
uh, that I can that they're broadcasting it online. And uh, next thing I know, there's thousands of people online. And, and, and so really what I was, and then they put it up on their site and, you know, it got maybe 300,000 views. It did really, really well. And, and uh, it, I, it, I'd never seen a clinic done like that. I knew you could do it, but they actually pulled it off. And I re, and that's part of Sawtooth. They have a retail store. They have a, a, another company called Chromacast, where if you go online and you want a guitar stand, picks, you name it, any accessory, that's their company. But in that really, first picture that Vic showed, do they actually sell the curly cord? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I they do everything. I and, uh, <laughs> but I really love Sawtooth. The, the, you know, they're bros. So it's like I deal with the owners of the company. You know, they're, they're great business people. They're L.A. based. So my mind, even though I live in Chicago, I lived in L.A. for so long and you can relate. It's like it changes you. It's like this L.A. thing gets in your system. And it's you know, it's really it changed me from Mike Beatty. Like I look like a Geico insurance salesman when I moved out there. And then, you know, I became, you know, look like a rock Michael star. Angela. Yeah. I didn't even know I turned into it. You just hang out with people. You you start to look like who you hang out with. Next thing you know, you go back east. You're like you look you like me. You know, like I've so become CC Deville. Help. Yeah, but uh, but I really no, I love, love, love CC. CC and I actually I, I remember when he used to come into Guitar Center um, back in the nineteen early eighties when I worked at Guitar Center on Sunset across the street from where it is currently, and I would work the effects ray, uh, department, and CC Deville would come in, and back then his name was Bruce. And he was just, you know, he was just as much of a Cheap Trick fan as I was. We're Me both too. huge Cheap Trick fans from, you know, obviously Cheap Trick from Rockford, Illinois, in that Chicago area. So, I mean, we were, we were all sort of influenced and uh, wanted that heavy guitar uh, sound. We liked pop music, but but we also liked it with, with heavy guitars on it, right? Yes. Yeah, you yeah. know, I being from Chicago and in the band Holland... Um, we opened up for Cheap Trick. You know, I've been to Rick's house before and uh, I've jammed with them before. We did Highway to Hell, man. And I, I was even in the studio uh, with them. I'm not saying I'm super close friends with them, but I've known Rick for a long time, you know, first name yeah. basis. And I remember being in the studio uh, in California when they were when they were recording The Flame. And man, I, I would just listen to this because Rick goes, yeah, come on down. And it was amazing. And I, they're one of my, I used to see Cheap Trick before they were big. And in the in the bars, because in Illinois, before I moved to California, they lowered the drinking age from 21 to 19, the exact year I turned 19. So I <laughs> had two years of going into the clubs uh, that that a lot of people didn't. I just lucked out by my age. So at that time. Yeah. Yeah. There, that's me around that time. Exactly. And uh, I, I would see Cheap Trick. I would see this band called MS Funk with a an unknown guitarist named Tommy Shaw. And I remember oh, wow. watching him and listening to that voice. I'm going, God, this yeah. guy can just sing like an angel. And next thing you know, he's in. He gets in sticks on the Crystal uh, Crystal Ball album. That's right. Yeah. And so you know, I, I had the benefit of those two years. But in those two years, the Cheap Tricks of the world. They were one of my all time favorite bands. I mean, yeah. I loved them. And uh, no when, when I was in Holland. Uh, Tom Worman lives off of Coldwater Canyon and, and a really beautiful mansion there. And he, when we were recording the album, he took me to his house and we were just talking about production stuff and, and, you know, about guitar playing and, and rhythm guitar. He was a real stickler on rhythm. And that's what he, you know, he, I, I don't, I don't like to talk about myself too much, but one of the things that he said to me, he goes, Mike, you are a really excellent rhythm guitarist. And he goes, that's the, and he really wanted, and he wanted to keep reinforcing it. And at that time he had done Doc N and, yeah. uh, you know, he was putting on stuff like the Carpenters yeah. and he told me something wild about Cheap Trick because he knew I was from the Midwest. Yeah. And he said, when I was a kid and I would listen to Cheap Trick, Robin Zander looked like an angel, literally. The guy yeah. was so handsome. The girls were, and he had Nielsen and he had Bunny. So he had the two cool. He had Tom dude. Peterson on bass. Exactly. And he had the two, two, he had the two rock stars in, 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 in uh, uh, Robin Zander and, and Tom Peterson. And then you had yeah, the Bunny two sort of, You know, the, the two sort of, yeah. 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 And, and, you know, and, and one thing, Worman, here's what I always thought. Uh, Cheap Trick had that song on their first album called Tax Man. Yep. You work hard, you make money. I love yep. that song. Absolutely. And I remember seeing Robin in the bars and he would sing really nice and clean. 
And then he would really rasp it out. And, and he rasped out more than he sang clean in the early days. And I used to think to myself, you know, I love this band to death, but I think Robin Sanders should sing a little cleaner. And, and when the first album came out, Jack Douglas did it, produced yes, it. Yes, he did. And I thought, he's still singing like, like the clubs. And here's what Mormon told me. It was I, I couldn't believe he said this. He said, Mike, he goes, he did In Color, that, you know, that classic. And he goes, you know what I told Robin? And we're just sitting there, just me and him in his house. And he goes, I told him that he's got to clean up his vocals, that he can't sing as raspy as he did, that it's, you know, it's kind of like telling Tom Petty, you know, like, live it like a refugee. And then, you know, in <laughs> or telling brain. Bob Dylan to be less Bob Dylan or something. Yeah. And, and, but I, I thought, hell. wow, because it, it was the exact same thing that I thought. And, but Tom was, and it was just such an experience. That's why well, I you can California. see that difference on those first two, the, the first two cheap trickers, it, cheap trick records are, is the big dichotomy of what they, because it sounds, there's, there's a, uh, well, if the first album is such a great rock and roll record, guitar it. driven, there's there's elements of punk with He's a Whore, but then there's Mandicello, which has like this really nice orchestration. But then you could see the development where things got a little bit more on the melodic, beatly pop uh, range with um, just even the production too. I mean, the uh, album version of I Want You to Want Me on the In Color album is so different than the live at Budokan version. Yeah. You know? It's slick. Yeah, yeah, I love the production of In Color. And, you know, they just got it right in every way. You know, mm -hmm. that the sound was right. Worman just knew. You know, the thing that I loved about Tom is he, he was, I really got to know him. And he really changed my life a lot. Uh, as Tom far as my, my thought process of making albums and just who a person is. He was an a &R guy for Epic Records. He discovered Boston. He told me, he said, their demo tape, was exactly like the album. He wanted to sign Rush and Leonard Skinner and they wouldn't let him. You know, here he does Ted Nugent's album with Stranglehold. He oh, just, yeah. he had a real knack for this stuff. And he that's what he was trying to do. A huge him. knack for the what was what was going to be popular or what or what he felt would be like the next thing. Yeah, he, he was really, you know, he was one of the main guys in the 80s. I mean, wow. you know, there's not many, what, him, Mutt Lang, maybe a couple other people. They were and the this, biggest, but. This stems back from the band Holland. And a lot of times, I do this a little bit later in the show, but because there's been some great comments about Holland, and I did see an uh, equipment question uh, from Remy that we'll come back to and we'll circle back. So Vic, our producer, I just want you to take, make a note of that because he wanted to ask about a question about the Tube Screamer. And uh, thank you very much much for asking that question Remy but uh, right now I want to actually do a segment that we usually do a little bit later but it's going to be a uh, celebrity let the people speak so and this one comes from one of your former members of uh, and you I know there's a history with this gentleman that's going to ask the question and the band Holland. So if Vic, our producer, is ready to ask this question, um, he is ready to ask you, Michelangelo uh, Badio. Here we go. Hey, Mike, Ryan, how you guys doing? Um, yeah, uh, Mike, uh, I've seen a lot of guys who perhaps are more embraced by the mainstream, we'll say. Um, copping a lot of your shit if it's visual stuff like the multi-neck guitar or the um uh you know the techniques involved you the first shredder when you see guys just outright stealing from you is that a compliment or is that like hey motherfucker that's my shit love you guys <laughs> Mwah. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Hey, hey, Alex, Hold Alex on. was in how he's a great guitar player. Good for There us. you go. I, I just want everyone to know that's our, our podcast favorite uh, man. I was not expecting Alex to ask that question shirtless, but I guess that was an extra bonus for the two of you <laughs> to be shirtless, folks, and all of you uh, watching in the live chat and the YouTube official channel, of course. That is Alex Kane, uh, played in the band Holland. Did you that's guys right. ever play in the band together, or was it different times? No, we we've been good friends for a long time. I, in fact, I went to go see him when he when he was in Holland. Uh, and I came back from uh, they were on tour, and and uh, but yeah, Alex is a great guitar player in his own right. Always busy, you know, always doing something cool. And so, what do you think about that question he asked? When people, death, what do you think was, about the question that he just asked about when people um, do the same sort of things that you have sort of pioneered? Do you take it as a compliment, or, compliment, well, or do you? 
I, I here I've, you know, I'm pretty, uh, how can I say it? When I started doing instructional programs uh, in the 80s, Starlix, you know, I, I was, I showed everything that I could show. In fact, I had fans telling me they think that I showed too much. I showed my over under in the, you know, technique. I call it the MAB over under in, in the mid eighties. Um, one, uh, and you know, I mean, I, you know, I've been around long enough. I saw Richie Blackmore play over the neck. I'm left-handed. This is my strong hand. And I'm left-handed as well. So this, Edward, I'm left-hand dominant as well. And, but, and you know, so to answer Alex's question, I, the only time I ever got upset about it, because I'm grateful, for example, like Herman Lee, it, you know, studied my things. A lot of the guitarists, the, the big name people give me credit for it, you know, because I, you know, and I think it's cool. It's like, I mean, you know, too, Ryan, it's sometimes easier to talk to Zach Wilde than it is to like one of the openers that thinks they're better than you, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. There, there, there seems to be a little bit of, of ego going on with some of the openers. And sometimes the chip on the shoulder is is a, is, a, is a good thing for you to have if it gives you that motivation to keep practicing, working harder. It's, it's a problem when it becomes something where it becomes disrespectful. And, yeah. like, I, and, and like I said, Zach, you're, you're exactly right because I've, I've interviewed Zach before. He's been nothing but a gentleman, has great, you know, and you can just talk to him, you know, guy to guy, guitarist to guitarist. Yeah. In fact, we, the, one of the conversations I had with Zach was he was asking me about the Nitro Freight Train solo. And then, you know, when I came up and, you know, too, you know, a lot of in the L.A. era of the 80s, it was so much competition. And so uh, but, you know, with with my techniques, the reason I invented the double is because I knew doing this, even if it's mine, which I, I'm pretty sure I've never seen a video from the old days that that somebody did it like me. But yeah. I said they can't copy a double guitar unless they get it built. So Alex, <laughs> so, so I'm just going to actually, you, you built the hardware. Yeah. You actually changed the hardware. For I figured, it. okay, if Stop. people are going to steal my stuff, they're going to have to build a guitar, darn it. <laughs> and, but, but you know what, to answer Alex's question, I don't have this like tremendous, I'm, I'm a win-win person. I'm not win-lose. So, you know, but unfortunately not everybody's like that, but I am flattered when people do it. But I, I got upset only one time in my life. And there was somebody that that actually was, they were taking my songs. They tattooed uh, tattoos like mine. They wore clothes like me. And they were doing my show with my music and trying to make a career out of it. And I just told the guy, I said, and I didn't even, wasn't even mean about it, but I said, look at, I'm still here. You know, this isn't a kiss. <laughs> it's not a tribute yet. yet. Yeah. You know, this is a, you know, you're, you're trying to, you're, you're doing my thing, you know, and claiming it's yours. I said, you know, in order, for, I said, you can't really do that. It's not going to be a career for you. You, you know, if you want to do a tribute, that's one thing, but um, you know, when people do it, like, again, I'll use Herman Lee as a great example. I just played with them when they came through Chicago, you know, we're good friends. He does this, but he gives me credit. And, and that's the thing that, that's, you know, I just want the legacy out there. I love people doing it. Like, for example, Sawtooth, for the first time ever, did a 50-piece limited edition run of my double. And there's That's a really amazing. popular is that, is it, internet when is, guy. is that coming out? When is, is that? Yeah, that, it came out. Uh, we're sold out of it. And, and a real popular young guitarist named The Do got one of these. And, and he, he demoed it. Uh, and, but, you know, people know that it's me and that that's the thing. So I don't really, I'm pretty thick skinned about it. I don't really care that people do this. You know, I just, let me ask you this. Try me, to, guy you, to guy. If you play my music and try to look like me and do this and make a career out of it, then I, that, that kind of bothered me a little. Let me ask you this because I, I remember I was in Los Angeles. I moved there in 83, the same year that you moved there. I was going to GIT. Was it Doug Marks? That had this problem was that was that the guy that you had the beef with? Which, which was it? Doug Marks was that his name? The guitar player? Did you oh, well, Doug Marks thing? is from Metal Method. Yeah, he's the yeah, owner but, of Metal. But no, but what, what, the the guy that was like completely copying your stuff was it Doug Marks or was it no no else? Doug Doug is the owner of Metal Method. He's the one that did Speed Kills DVDs and okay. This this is actually a younger guy. It happened. Uh, but there, yeah, there's been other people that try to do this back in okay. the day. I don't really know their names, though. 
I remember Doug Marks having really big blonde hair and yes. you had the bi really big brunette hair. So I'm glad that, that you two are friends because you are the salt and pepper. <laughs> you're the salt and pepper shakers of shred guitar. You know, Doug is really great. He's still got the passion for, it. you know, that picture that you just shot. Go, um, that was, that's my Gibson double guitar that was built by Gibson. I love it. Yeah, it's it's pretty wild. It has a little bit of an explorer like vibe. Board. So what what actually uh, gave you that? Um, we we know where the inspiration comes, right? You get this inspiration where, like, I I, I have this technique where I'm going to go over over under technique, but but then I can do it with a double guitar. It's one thing to have the idea to build that guitar, but then how do you make it a reality? It's a good question. Um, you know, when, when I was in school, I would draw, I would do drawings. And I saw in Chicago, every Sunday they had a show. It was on public television. It was Channel 11, WTTW, where one week you could see the Chicago Symphony String Quartet. The next week it would be Willie Nelson, all genres of music. And I remember, uh, and then one week they had Grand Funk Railroad. I mean, you know, they just, <laughs> it was so at all different styles, you know, the, from country to, to orchestral to rock. And one week they had a jazz concert with a, with a guy named Rasan Roland Kirk. And at the and here, I'm a kid, you know, I'm, I'm not even in high school yet. I'm watching this and you know, I was in middle school, junior high, as we used to call it. And the guy ended the show. He was an older guy at the time playing two saxophones at the same time. And I'm like, huh? It was like, he's literally doing this, a jazz saxophonist. And then what they would do is they would have, they would, they would do like quick bios of the bands. So the, he invented this thing called circular breathing. I saw this on TV. He could breathe in and out at the same time. The dude could hold, hold a note for 20 minutes. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. He was like, I, I could, I'd never seen anything like this guy. And I said, you know, like, when, it will be mine. I will do this. <laughs> and I started thinking, and I started coming up with the idea. I'm left-handed. I play piano. I can pull this off. And, and again, it was my thought process. Like when Alex asked, do I get mad? I can't stop somebody from doing this and, and calling it theirs. I, I can only get it out there that I'm the originator of it. And it's my mm -hmm. trademark, but I can't stop people. But I figured if I have a guitar, nobody else has, they're going right. to have to go through a pretty detailed process in order to, to do what I'm doing. And so I started coming up with designs and I'll, and Eddie Van Halen is the one that put it over the top for me. Really? I saw Van Halen's second tour. It was the one of the greatest rock shows I've ever seen. I have a story about David Lee Roth at that show. He, he was unbelievable. And Eddie played cathedral. I, I was just, wow. I was oh, now, now, were they headlining at this point? Or oh yeah, they, they were headlining, headlining. Okay. and, uh, you know, sold out like 20,000 seats. Uh, you know, it, it was their, the tour for their second album. So Van and, Halen too. And what, and what is, what is, uh, David Lee Roth do that just impresses you? Like, okay. No other? This is kind of, as a really cool story. Um, okay. well, we're, that's what we're here for. We're okay. here for the cool stories. When, when I was Angel a kid, my mom loved Elvis Presley. And this is, it has to do, there's an Elvis component to this. And my sister didn't want to go. I still have the original tour booklet. This is in the 70s. I was 16 years old. And it was when he was still really thin, but it was later part of his life. It was the comeback tour. So he was dressed in all those, you know, the stuff you see Elvis the, later. You're talking about Elvis, the black, the black leather. Uh, yeah. Era. And then he was yeah. wearing like those white jumpsuits with the cape and doing the American yeah. trilogy. And he did a move. And, and there were video screens even back in the day. So, you, you know, they were, you know, obviously the technology wasn't like now, but so there were these two big video screens and, and my mom was going crazy. These girls are screaming, you know, and I'm like, I, my mom's embarrassing me. And she's like, oh, help us. Oh, my God. You know, every <laughs> girl around me, oh, my God, he's so handsome. You know, just, and he was singing like a bird and he did a move, Ryan. It blew my mind, you know, because he was doing this karate chop stuff. And then he okay. goes like this. He stops. Uh, he just stops. Does nothing. Stands there like this, like a frozen statue. And I've never seen this before in my life. The entire stadium quieted down to almost nothing. And then he goes like this. When he waited for silence, he went. And he just moved his head. Ah! <laughs> Everybody starts screaming. Now, here's how it relates to Van Halen. 
This is the era where David Lee Roth had the lion's mane and he had the body of a chip and tail dancer. I mean, he was cool. Yeah. Alex Van Halen's got three kick drums. He stands on the drum riser. I saw this. This is not an exaggeration. He does a scissor kick. Like, and he does the I know that. I've seen that picture before. He 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 jumps off and he lands like this. And what does he do? Does it move? I he love does it. the Elvis move. He stands there perfectly still, and the same reaction happened. And I didn't know it at the time. It was only after it happened I put the two together. The entire stadium quiets down, and he did the same move. He just tilted his head. They had the big video monitors, the same reaction. It was wow. like seeing – I've never seen power. Like when you can control an audience like that, Yeah. I mean, that was that was – sheer power to me i've never seen it you know i mean the control roth had he was that cool roth must have saw the same show that you and your so that's my story (laughs) yeah no no roth must have seen that same exact tour uh that you and your mom saw at that point Mm -hmm. you know so that answers the roth part part but what did eddie van halen do at that show that actually put the the thing over the top for the double for the guitar after you know i've been a huge van halen fan since day one but I also realized I don't play like Eddie at all, you know, and I never try. I, for a long time, I, I didn't even tap because I, I didn't want to steal his thing. I said, that's him. I, it's not me. And, you know, I, re, I put him in the Jimi Hendrix category that there's no possible way you can notate a Van Halen solo. I could write the notes out, but unless you hear it, you have no idea really what it sounds like. And so anyway, I was looking at, I, I'm, I'm in the process of like, in my brain, kind of figuring out this double guitar. And, you know, I know it's going to be like this. I used to do drawings where the two guitars are like this, (laughs) kind of biblical. And, and, you know, I said, that's not going to work. And then I saw a picture of Van Halen. It was a full body shot in like Hit Parade or Circus, one of those mags. And he's standing there and he's got his guitar up like this. And I, and I look at it and it's like, that's it. And so I, I'm, I draw, I'm not the greatest drawer in the world, but I love to draw and I'm pretty good at it. I had tracing paper. So I put a sheet of paper, I traced his image, I flipped it over and I saw this. Wow. And I said, there is my double. And then what I did was, this is kind of, kind of funny. I, I have a protractor from when I was a kid. It measures yeah. angles, a little half moon. Plastic. I remember. Mm-hmm. I remember those things. That you you used them in geometry or exactly. in some sort of school. Yeah. And, and so what I did is I measured. Like here's ninety degrees. I just measured it. It came out to be about one hundred and fifteen degrees because here it would be ninety degrees. That's not really a double. So it was like this. So it was about one hundred fifteen. So when we made the first double, we just kind of literally took a right-handed and a left-handed guitar put it down on a bench, kind of <laughs> eyeballed it to get to this. We, I took the picture of Van Halen that I had. I, I put them both together, cut it out. So that was my template. We kind of eyeballed it, got it close, chopped it, and there's my double. <laughs> and then the mechanism it. to put it together. That was another, that was a real tricky one. Now, see, right out of the gate, I can see where that angle that you have makes complete sense of why Van Halen would do it and why... Uh, Slash used to do that. You know, when I played with him, he'd take his Les Paul just to get it higher, right? And, and, and easier to play. That's why you'll see him play at that angle a lot now because it is easier to play your guitar because exactly. he's always string it so low. And I love to string my guitar low too, but when I use that same trick, yeah. you know, I definitely, I definitely uh, pay homage and uh, borrow it from Slash's move because that it does make your... A hand in your both hands easier to play, right? Yeah. Well, you know, if you look at like you know, with my lessons, I always the you know, knock on wood, I've never ever been hurt. And you know, it's like there's a lot of difference. And and you would be a, a the, you're a perfect example. You're out there touring it. You're doing it for real on a high level. So if if somebody's going to get hurt or not. You are the authority to sit. It's kind of like talking to an NFL running back or a quarterback. And so when you tour like this, you know, it's easy to sit. And I'm not, I don't degrade it. You know, I'm not trying to criticize anybody who just sits at their computer and plays. 
but it's a different world getting up there in front of people and standing doing and it for real performing yeah yeah performing per exactly performance and practice are two completely different things it, yeah right. it's two different worlds and a lot of young people they're they're more focused on being internet influencers than actually doing you know the tours and performing and where that was my goal but i found that when you play with your guitar like that the angle of your of your hand your wrist it's almost straight out like this and it's yeah. really comfortable to play. See, sometimes when you bring it down, look at that. You know, it, it kind of, your, your hands, but when you keep your guitar up, it's really comfortable. And I, I think that's it. one of the You reasons. know what, this dovetails into, I, I swear I was gonna, folks, I was gonna save this for a little bit later because it's a very, very, another celebrity let the people speak uh, question. But I, I, I would feel remiss if we didn't get into it right now. But Vic, you have to run the animation for let the people speak just so people know what it is. But folks, this is celebrity let the people speak. Come on, Vic. <laughs> Listen to this question now, because I think uh, it has something to do with the whole technique of what you have created with this invention of not just the double guitar, but the four neck guitar. Rick, can you run that clip? Or not? <laughs> what is up, guys? Nita Strauss here. We are getting ready to go on stage at the O2 Arena in London. But first, I have a question for the great Michelangelo. Uh, I'm a big fan, of course, of your amazing shred techniques and all the innovations that you've made in our instrument. And I want to know what challenges, what were some challenges that we might not have thought of when you were developing your two-hand double guitar, quad guitar, crazy techniques? What's some stuff that the average guitar player might not have thought of uh, that went through your head when you were coming up with that? I'm excited to see the answer. Thanks, Ryan, for letting me ask. Oh, that's great. <laughs> well, there you go. There, there amazing, by the way. She filmed uh, that just the other night before uh, our O2 Arena in London show. So thank you very much, Nita Strauss, for doing that. And she wants to, you know, answer that question about, because not only was it a, a double guitar, you ended up going quad. And, and This is a really funny story. That's true. I mean, I, there's no reason for me to lie because I've said it all over. You know, you don't have to lie. The truth is the truth. Uh, when I had the double guitar. Now I had just, I had been playing this since the Holland days. So that was about four years before Nitro. Now the band Nitro with Jim Gillette, uh, he was only 19 when we got signed. We were signed to Rhino Records, which was a subsidiary of Warner Brothers. And they alone were like a quarter of a billion dollar company. Yeah. Jim was a kid back then, still a teenager. And, and uh, he was a, uh, what happened was I, there's a guitarist named Guy Man Dude. And, and back in the Guy day, Man he was my Dude. rhythm guitar player. And he left the band. He went on and did. Uh, yeah, that's the Forneck, the uh, Gibson Forneck too. Gibson built that uh, through Wayne Charvel. So anyway, about a, a few days now at this time, Steve Vai had joined David Lee Roth. I actually went. They, they rented out. I think it was the Forum. It was one of the a gigantic venue to rehearse. Just anyway, to have I was a sound invited stage, to go to the yeah. rehearsal. So I'm watching Vi and David Lee Roth and Billy Sheehan and, you know, et cetera. And, and uh, anyway, I'm in this studio with Guy. We go to like, it was one of like Cherokee or one of the LA studios. And there's Steve. And, and I see him and he was looking and he had told me at a poison show one time that he was thinking of a guitar that's lefty and righty. And I pulled out a picture in my wallet. I go, you mean like this, Steve? He's like, oh, my God. <laughs> and, and so he didn't say anything about his heart guitar to me. And, and the video was debuting days after I saw him in the studio. So anyway, the video of the heart guitar. Yeah. And Steve and I are, you know, we're, we're not the, you know, I, I'm not super close to him, but we're on a really good terms and I, I like him and I respect him immensely. And, and we've never really had issues, but here's what happened. So he comes out with this heart guitar, but again, I had to figure out the neck angles. You know, I did all this preliminary research. All he had to do was come up with the shape, the heart guitars and add another neck. And, and we're sitting at, at the time, one of the offices of Rhino was in Santa Monica. So Jim and I are in Santa Monica. We're having a meeting with the label. Our first album, OFR, is coming out. 
uh, Freight Train's going to be the first single. They loved it. They loved our album. They were ready to promote. They promoted the heck out of us. That solo is out of control. Our label this is great. He's control. like, Michael, you have two necks. Steve Vai has three. What can you do about it? I went, four. We love it. Four necks. Yes. And th- that will be the angle of the guitar. Four necks. Oh, my God. I said it as a joke. I'm like, four? And I said it like like, four? And, you know, like, and all of a sudden, but here's the cool thing, Ryan. I, you know, at the time, you know, I was having, a, I had a guy named Wayne Charvel building all my guitars. This wow. is Charvel, the man. But, yeah. you know, that built ZZ Top, that did Van Halen's, the guy. Legend. So I, Legend. I go to, he lived in the Redlands at the time. And I, I call him up. I go, Wayne, I have a project for you. And and Jim uh, Gillette was really good at designing guitars too, like the shapes. So Jim and I worked on it. We came up with this X-Wing that looked like Star Wars. I go to Wayne uh, in the Redlands. And it does say, have a, a bit of a, of a of an X-Wing type of vibe. Pardon? The, or, or oh, it, yeah. it has a Star Wars sort of, it, it's, it looks like one of the ships in Star Wars now that, yes. I, that I think about it. But, but here's, you know, I, I'm kind of, I have kind of an engineering mind. For example, the way the double guitar, the very first one we ever did worked. And I always get help. I'm not a lone wolf. I, like the mechanism to put the double guitar together is two metal rods with a flight case latch. You go, boom. Lock and load. It takes two seconds, and that's how you're the, able to travel with it, right? Because you couldn't, tr- you could something like that. You can't really just do a, a fly-in gig, right? If, if fact, it was one piece, my flight cases look like a keyboard case for the because you know I, I when I case up the doubles, uh, right. it, they they fit in the case like this. The re, it's actually a pretty small case, and then when you put it together, it becomes mm. one. Well, the quad was different, and I I told Wayne, uh, so I'm out at the Redlands at a shop. And I said, Wayne, think of Steinberger guitars. I said, think of rifles. You know, I'm not a big gun guy, but I said, make the body small, four of them. And we put seven strings on the two top ones, high A's though, not low B's. And I said, create four guitars. And I said, what if we use a back plate? And the back plate can dictate the shape. He's like, great. See, the thing about Wayne is I could give him an idea. He could make it come to fruition. This guy, it's Wayne Charvel. I mean, I knew Grover Jackson. He made, you know, it's it's weird because I wasn't, a, I didn't know a lot of details about guitars. When you have a guy like Wayne and they give you Stradivarius equivalent guitars every time, you're like, okay, great. You know, I got used to, I didn't know what anything else was besides a Charvel made guitar. That doesn't mean it looked like a Charvel, like a San Dimas or something. So anyway, we, I had this idea of four separate guitars. And, and then Wayne came up with the idea. He took this aluminum and made it so artistic. And then we, so we, the first version we had was two seven strings, two six strings, and you had to screw each guitar on. It took about 10 minutes. The back plate dictates the shape. So we created back plates that look like that. That was the quad. Then we had, then I said, Wayne, there's a few variations I want. I said, This is hard to play in concert. Let's put two in line like this. So he creates another back plate. So now the four guitars can be two and two. And then we even created a third where it just became a double guitar. So we just used the two top ones. And if you see in the freight train video, I used the quad and the two top ones as a double. It was just brilliant engineering. And And, and when you're playing now, is there is there a different approach to playing? all th- three of those designs or is it the same ter- sort of approach that you take in playing them? It, it's, it's, it's way different because uh, first of all, each guitar has its own neck and I mean, its own amp, obviously its own neck, but it has its own amp. Like if I was going to play the double, it would be through two amps. The guitars were always separate guitars. You can't put two guitars through one amp. It's going to be bad feedback. So yeah. I had a four amp setup. And what happens is there's, there's, it's, it becomes a strange thing when you put them all together. It's like the sum of the parts is different <laughs> than just the individual things. And, and what I mean is there's, there's more feedback involved. And so what I did was, you know, people say, well, how could you play all four at the same time? A looper. I had two ah, loopers. So okay. I could play it like do, 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 loop it, do something on the other side. And, and then you have to be careful because it doesn't always match. 
but I used to do things that it, it would you could get away, you could get away with it. I again, your experience with the piano helps you out. Yeah, and then I could play the two top ones. And, and so I could play four at the same time. And then I worked, you know, I had all these wild tricks. Like, for example, pick here, hand here. It looks really off the wall, but it's still You're becoming same, a magician more than you are a musician at this point. <laughs> yeah. And then I can play left-handed. I taught myself to truly play lefty. So I, I another thing that I did. Did you was, really teach? I mean, that is such a hard, even yesterday we were at the Gibson showroom here in, uh, in London. We're in Manchester right oh, now, cool. uh, but we went to the showroom in, in London and Chuck, our bassist, um, you know, he's left-handed. I'm left-handed. Um, he, there was a left-handed guitar there and he says, try playing the, just a riff left-handed. So I started, I try to play smoke on the water. And he's like, it's like the first time you've ever picked up a guitar. It's weird. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, you know, when I was growing up, being left-handed, I used to like, we used to take like badminton rackets. I did. And then I would draw guitar shapes on, on paper and, and like make pretend I was air guitaring, but I always air guitar lefty. And when, and when I was 10, you know, I, I didn't work yet. So my dad goes, are you sure you want to play guitar? And I go, yeah, we, there were no lefty guitars available. And so I got this Tysco for like 35, I think my dad the one in that first photo that we had. Sport. Yeah. I and he that. goes, and and and, he, and we could only find right-handed ones, and it felt so weird. And he goes, my, "I'll never forget." My dad goes, "Son, you'll have a great advantage playing a right-handed guitar being left-handed." Translation: If you want to play guitar at all, you better learn on this because there are, <laughs> are no left-handed. It guitars. is kind of a financial decision, but then again, my and here's my theory on this, and I've said uh -huh. it on the podcast before about why people ask me, like, I tell them I'm left-handed. They go, well, why don't you play guitar left-handed then? And I say, here's exactly the reason. Uh, when the guitar first started, uh, it was pretty much important because your left hand would be more in a stationary position and this hand would be doing arpeggios everywhere. So it was important for your right hand to be uh, dominant. But with the invention of the guitar pick, going up and down, up and down at a very fast uh, speed, but then opening up the guitar neck to go up and down in later years, it became more important actually for your left hand to be dominant. So I think I've been doing it right all along, yeah. right? You're, and, and, you're and in you, Manchester with Alice Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And the, and, and the other thing is, I tell people, you never see a left-handed piano. That's right. <laughs> you no, know, you're exactly right. And you know, I, I made that, it, it's interesting that you said that I made that uh, uh, observation when I, when I, yeah, I used to do a lot of guitar clinics and I really loved it and I don't do many anymore, but, but I, I, I toured all over the world doing guitar clinics. And I used to tell people, think of the double guitar, not as two pianos normal, but as a right-handed piano and then reverse every key. This is a truly left-handed guitar. Think about playing a left-handed piano and a right-handed piano at the same time. That's really weird. I, blow my mind. And, and, and that's what, it's hard you, and, and you know what I guitar. did too, Ryan, that, that I read an article one time. I never got to see Jimi Hendrix. So it was a little bit, I, I just, it, it just never worked out. And, uh, you know, it's a little, I won't say it's before my time, but it kind of was, I was too young. And, and, and uh, you know, just at that age where I, I wasn't going to concerts yet. I just missed it. You know, yeah. Elvis like was one of the, you know, that was a few years after he had passed away, Hendrix. And, and so, but I read this article. It was, again, one of the big rock mags. I don't remember. It said Jimi Hendrix played guitar in more positions than any person had ever done. And I thought, what did that mean? So one of the things that I did with the double is I wrote a list of things of what, what can you do with this? You know, can you, you can play this way. I can play in unison. I can play in harmonies. I can play harmony, melody. And then I said, let's get bizarre with this. What else can you do? <laughs> I, I remember I was, do you remember the country club in Reseda? Of course, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I was playing the country club one, one time. And, and I remember this is hilarious. So I'm playing my double, right? And I'm doing my thing and it's, you know, a big crowd and, and I'm hungry. And I swear, I'm thinking, I love Del Taco. Taco Bell sounds good. And I'm playing, thinking <laughs> about 
quesadillas and hard shell chicken tacos. <laughs> I'm playing like this and I'm hungry. And it's like on autopilot. You know, I'm looking like I'm into it, but I'm I know what I I've done this solo a million times. I I, I can do it in my sleep. And I'm Del like, Taco had the best quesadillas. I I, I thought oh, Del God. Taco had a much better quesadilla than Taco Bell. I Just agree. And I'm thinking note. them quesadillas with the hot sauce. <laughs> and all of a sudden, like, and then that voice in my head goes, What are you doing? You're on stage. And I I literally did this. On stage at that time, I went, and I just flipped my hands like this and started playing in harmonies. And, and then my brain goes, Del Taco. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> well, uh, wait a second. That's that's a total audible move that you pulled. Pardon? That was an audible. Like, like if you're talking NFL, you, yes, you, you, yeah. you're you looking at the line, you're maybe seeing the defense, and you just pull an audible. You yeah. chitch. Yeah, but I, then again, isn't that a little bit disingenuous because – isn't it true, and this is a fact or fiction question, and you usually pepper those into the show, um, that you played on Taco Bell ads when you were a session musician in Chicago. So weren't you really not being true <laughs> to your Taco Bell roots when that happened? True. No, you it's are true. fact, folks. It's a fact. <laughs> well, that is correct. And I did. I was I did a lot of session work in Chicago. And, you know, if you think about Chicago at that time, Oprah Winfrey, daytime TV, Chicago. Jerry Donahue, Chicago. Uh, Jerry Springer, Chicago. All the daytime talk shows were in Chicago. They were the jingle market of the U.S. I did Taco Bell, United Way, but I like Del Taco better. <laughs> you can't get it in Chicago. Like it is said, true. Del Taco is Del such a, for me, it's such a Los Angeles thing. And it was like, I mean, I don't even know if they even still have Del Tacos, but it, it was like, yeah. I mean, this episode wasn't supposed to be all just about Del Taco, but apparently we've uh, covered the gamut on it. But we've covered the gamut on <laughs> well, so much you know, of the double guess, guitar, the quad the, guitar. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, for me, the point was, you know, that my mind just started to wander. I was getting bored. And, and I think that anybody who has a lot of stage experience, every once in a while, the evolution of what you do moves forward because you might do something one night where you go and you incorporate it in your show. And so when I was playing this, I, I, was, just, I was playing harmonies, diatonic harmonies and thirds. And I had done this for so, you know, for years already, I was just getting bored of it. And so my mind started to wander a little bit, uh, a lot. And, and that's when I said, you know, I better cool it. And I, I literally, I, I was at the country club. I just went like this. And I mean, I switched and I nailed it. It was luck, part luck and, and part just because I, had, I, and I'd never practiced this before. Whoa. And so then it became part of the show. But it, and a lot of this stuff is by accident, like the four neck guitar. You've got two. He's got three. What can you do? Four. You know, yeah, I mean, it, it's just the way it's playing on stage. Amazing. I mean, a lot of what I, I, I learned everything, the over under, everything was was developed from performing, you yeah. know, and, and, uh, and the, the quad, too. You we know, knew this I, would happen, Michael, uh, Angelo, Beatty. We well, I told you at the beginning. I said, "Well, you know, we're usually last a certain amount of time, but then we all I look at the clock, and it's like we haven't even started. We just started our conversation. And we're already pretty much into an hour into. And usually, I I, I run a, a little ad that we have a half hour into it, and I'd like to run an ad right now. We just take a quick, 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 uh, maybe one minute break here, and we can talk about the um, System 12 guitar method, because that's my guitar method. I teach beginning guitar players and, the, and teaching the foundations. I know you have yours, so I want to talk about that right after the commercial break. But here we are, folks. Um, thank you so much for joining us on In the Trenches. We have Michael Angelo Badio, um, and he is the original. Well, there's, a, there's another Michelangelo out there, but then there's even the original. I was thinking about that. The, you said the word biblical earlier in the show. There is the actual Michelangelo that would kind of trump both of the Michelangelo that made the records and the Michelangelo Badio. The guy, the painter, Michael. Of course. Right? Yes. Yeah, so, but, the, but he's not going to come back and get your name. Right <laughs> now, we have the or, or originator of the double uh, guitar, the quad guitar, and so much more. We'll talk more right after this commercial break with Michael Angelo Badio. Thank you so much. Hello, Ryan Roxy here from the Alice Cooper Band, and I'd like to talk a little bit about one of my favorite things, playing guitar. Here at the RGA headquarters, which stands for Roxy Guitar Army, by the way, we've put together a guitar learning system that will get you playing and understanding the guitar faster than any other teaching program out there. We call it the System 12 Guitar Method. 
and it's designed to make the most out of your time, your effort, and your passion for learning guitar. By combining new school technology, old school mentoring, and the number 12, we have invented a new way to teach guitar. And over the past year, we have helped so many people who wanted to start or continue their guitar journey do exactly that. Now, we'd like to help you. There's never been a better time to start learning guitar than right now. If you think it's too hard, the System 12 makes it easy. If you think it'll take too much time, the System 12 will have you playing in 12 weeks. And if you think it's too expensive, the entire System 12 costs less than what one private guitar lesson would cost you at your local music store. Check out the official site or the links below in the description of this video to join the RGA and get started on your guitar journey with the System 12 Guitar Method. Now, let's get back into the trenches for some more rock and roll. Enjoy the show. Enjoy the ride. Mwah! That's it. So there you go, that's folks. Uh, that's some information about the System 12. And uh, we are here with uh, Michael Angelo Badio, who has an, his own guitar uh, system, and he's been teaching lessons as well. And um, you, you don't teach guitar privately, but you have worked with some pretty famous guitar players and uh, worked with on certain lessons and techniques with guys like maybe Tom Morello, Mark Tremonti, just to name a, a few a great guitar players that you've worked with. Is, is that uh, – are private lessons not a thing for you, or do you just like to, you know, share knowledge with an, any, somebody else? With, with Tom – he grew up in Libertyville, which was really close to the music. You know, he grew up in Illinois. So um, I didn't actually know that I taught him. Uh, he came up to me at a NAMM show in the, in the 90s. And he, I, I was just standing there. And he comes up and he said, thank you. And I looked at his badge. I go, whoa, this is Tom Morello. And, and he goes, and I go, for what? And, and, and you know, I, I was like kind of shocked. And he goes, that I, he took, he said he took lessons from me. That he had, he was taking lessons. It's a store called the Music Gallery in Highland Park. They're still there. I've known, I've known them since I was 16 years old, and yeah. it's a very affluent area of Illinois. And and uh, but Tom said it was a musical epiphany because uh, he said uh, one uh, uh, a quote that he had speeditis because you know my method it, it's pretty simple. You know it starts here. It's like a triangle. You know you have to coordinate all three parts. And uh, so Tom was in person. Mark and I, you know, it's hard to, to just say I gave him lessons. Really what happened was we were jamming buddies. And, and you know, we, we got to meet each other right when he started Alter Bridge. And I became real close friends with him. Like, you know, I know his family really well. I, I was at his house. And we would, like, before concerts, like, uh, he, you know, Alter Bridge, we would, we would just jam for hours and then you know he did a couple of Cree reunions i go backstage we'd spend the entire day so and and mark is is you know he's a very disciplined guy and you know he'd be like okay mike show me something new and so you know and i talked to him about my technique and 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 he's played on like three or four of my solo albums and so it was but it, it the what i did was it, it kind of functioned as like an overseer you know where gotcha. we're like i watched you know, because knock on wood again, right? You know, I, I, you know, I've never had a hand injury, but I'm so meticulous about like hand position. And, you know, I want to economy of motion. I want to move as, you know, economy not obviously, a great, this, but great even word. this, or yeah. like with my double guitar, um, we just did a video with a guy, Rob Skellum, and he's a young internet influencer, millions of subscribers. We're going to talk about some of these collaborations that you've been yeah. going, that have been he, going viral. I pick it upside down. <laughs> levitate it and play and, and i mean people never even thought of it before until rob who's a pretty big guy he went to play it and he he almost dropped it it's not easy and, and but i'm very conscious about keeping myself healthy uh finger wise and so that's kind of the stuff that i would talk to mark about and but mark's really just amazing uh you know to listen to his uh you know, songs that he's written. He's a number one hit songwriter. But one of the things that was really cool is my instructional programs helped out a lot of people. For example, it was John this, are you talking about uh, like speed kills? And are you talking about? Yeah. And then I had one called a Starlix video before speed kills. Okay. And that was, uh, I was still, on, um, I had, I was still playing locally in LA and I hadn't been signed with Nitro, but it was after the Van Hollen. 
And yeah, exactly. Right. That, that exact era. And that's right around when I did this first instructional program and people like uh, John Petrucci watched it, got the idea of jazz threes. Cause I always use jazz picks. He studied it. Michael Romeo from symphony X. Uh, he told me that he studied it. And, and one of the biggest one was dime. I'll never forget this. And I was in my and yeah. dime, Saw me in concert before they were big. Cowboys from Hell had just come out. I didn't even do Speed Kills yet. We were in Florida recording our second album, Nitro. And we were we went to this little club. Nobody was there except for the band. We knew the, the bartenders there. We were just hanging out. And this, and my guitar tech, we he went by Dragon. He's like, dude, you got to hear this band, bro. They rule, dude. You know, he was from <laughs> Fresno and full out ecstasy, bad, dude. And so <laughs> we go there to see this unknown band named Pantera. Nobody was in the crowd. And I'm standing in the audience like this. I see this dude come out with this beard and these long shorts, you know. And this is the era of Larry Bird, you know, with the, the little, you know. The little, <laughs> yeah, the tiny the shorts. Uh, yeah, He's yeah, got yeah, these absolutely. long shorts on. We're thinking, boy, he looks out there. And here were these L.A hair metal guys no we don't look weird but uh and and he he actually stopped there was nobody around me for 10 feet there was nobody there literally and in cowboys from hell had just been released and we're in orlando florida and all of a sudden Dom goes like this he goes is that michelangelo i'm like yeah dude he goes i got your instructional program dude he goes you're like my guitar teacher man and then he goes pantera's gonna dedicate tonight's set to michelangelo and I was just floored. And yeah. and I mean, I had heard those songs, Cowboys from Hell and that. I was already a fan before. I, and of course, uh, you know, shortly after that, they exploded. I mean, it was just like, boom, you know, that album just, just blew up. But I talked to Dime afterwards and, you know, we just got to be really friendly. We would do a, you know, I was with Washburn for a while in the 90s with Dime. And so we would do like in stores together. And, you know, I got to know him really well. And he was supposed to play on one of my albums called Hands Without Shadows, right? The, yeah, the next passed. tour yeah. stop was Chicago wow. before he got shot. We were wow. we were just devastated. I, I mean, <sighs> we had this been way too much up. of that, you Pardon? know, even, it, it, well, the shooting just, you know, has been way too much of that in our current climate still, you know, senseless stuff. You know, um, you know, I, I know this is an off topic thing, but, when I knew Vinnie Paul, his brother, pretty well, and we would go, you know, because of the Dean, you know, Vinnie was with D-Drum. That was a Dean company. So we would go to Europe and, and you know, we Vinnie would, you know, we would congregate like in these different music uh, expos, you know, like in Frankfurt, Germany, the Music Mason stuff. And Vinnie used to always have a bodyguard with him at that time called Cowboy. And so it was me, Vinnie. Uh, David Vincent from Morbid Angel, who's our close friend, and we were sitting down and we were we were had a really nice dinner in Germany and, and we were drinking beer and and uh, Vinny told me I I would never ask in a million years you know what happened I mean how rude can that be you no, know no, 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 I would no. never he ever was, ask. he was up for sharing he was and Vinny sharing. talked to me about it he talked to me about what happened on stage he's like he goes man he goes the only thing that saved me was my drums. He said the guy was pointing the gun right at his face and shooting, and it was ricocheting off the hardware of his drums and his drums. And I'm like, I, I to this day, you know, I can just picture us sitting there. And I mean, me and yeah. you know, like David were just like, we didn't say a word. I mean, no comment. What well, you know, I didn't ask him about it, but I can only imagine the the feeling of that. You know, a point yeah. blank yeah. range, and uh, you know what what you know to live through that ordeal. It was just mm. something else. Mm. And that, and, that, and literally after that, you end up, um, that's what you're both working with Washburn. And then um, you also work with Dean as well. So, I mean, there's so much history between the two of you, you know, and the fact that he was your Starlicks, uh, you know, protege. And I do have to say this in all honesty, uh, there is another name to add to that Starlix list because here I am guilty of that, or actually proud to say that I did uh, take some Starlix lessons as well. They were yeah. a great company. It, yeah. Because you know what? I remember now borrowing from my buddy that was at, um, that I had gone to GIT with 
because I wanted to learn some stuff and I wanted to learn some licks and star licks was the way to do it. I love yeah. it. And, and, and the speed kills as well um, with a bunch of other your instructional programs, because you are always putting out new stuff, like whether it's um, instructional programs or some of these videos that you touched upon earlier um, that you have, put together with these young internet influencers. Um, how is that going right now? And what are some of the new projects in the works for you? Well, well thanks. Uh, you know, I think, and again, I mean, we're, we're, we're live on your show. Uh, so you've, you've embraced this concept too of, you know, creating, you know, a, you know, media uh, platform for yourself and celebrity online. Um, what, what I did is, you know, there's so much great guitar playing that's out right now. It's incredible. And I love to keep up with the young players, but it's reinforced something with me that I can't worry about trying to sound like the newest guitar player. I can only be the best Michelangelo Badio that I can be. And that's my goal. I, I'm not in competition with anyone else. I just want to maintain my own skill. And so what happened was I started getting... Um, like just some of the younger players, just we started talking it really was just social media stuff. And one thing led to another. And I started doing shred collabs with like people like Andy James and then uh, the, like uh, Jeff Schroeder from Smashing Pumpkins. I even started, I even, uh, Billy Corgan has got a, a wrestling thing that he does. And so Jeff and I, uh, Jeff wrote the theme song and I played on it. And I started getting involved with a lot of other guitarists but once I got with Jared Dines, he's like one of the big young internet influencers. It blew up. And then uh, we just released a video with a, a guy named Rob Scallon, 2.3 million subscribers. And he's wow. a really good guitar player. And I met him at the Dragon Force show that I played at in Chicago just a couple months ago. And we started talking and hit it off. And he said, he goes, Mike, he goes, I'm, you know, he does a lot of exotic instruments. He, he lives in Chicago. He goes, can I come to your house and see your guitar collection? Cause I have a pretty big collection. It's displayed. Yeah. My living room. That's my living room. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we just hit it off. It looks like a bunch of house guests that won't leave, but why, they're great why, house guests. Yeah. You know, why have furniture when you could have guitars? And, uh, but I've got over 200 guitars and uh, I love collecting them. Herman's got a, Herman Lee's got a pretty big number too. We were talking about it because he collects too. And whereas John Petrucci doesn't, he doesn't care. You know, there, it doesn't mean, I'm, I'm, it doesn't make me any better of a guitarist. I just, I love guitars so much. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, Rob came over and he, he's such a great video editor and he's really knowledgeable. He's really good. And, and, you know, if I've learned anything, don't underestimate people, but um, he approached it like me. We were like kids, like we're just talking. And I, and my quad guitar, I had it rebuilt uh, on one rebuild because the original one got stolen. I had lasers what? put in it. We're trying to get the lasers to work, you know, <laughs> a quad guitar with lasers. With lasers and I mean, yeah. it was just insane. And it's blowing up. It, it just oh, was wait. released a little over a week ago. It's got about a half a million views. It's going to be in the that's millions, amazing. you know. But I've seen to let's, align. Let's myself. find that guitar. Because that's, you, you know what, let's find that guitar with, with the people that are out there watching right now, this podcast, uh, we do a little segment right now and it's a perfect way to get this animation going um, because whether it is this uh, instrument or not, this is definitely the one that got away. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Usually the one that got away is about a piece of gear that you had to sell at one point or whether, um, you know, it got stolen, which is obviously this quad guitar. So what's the story? How, when did it get stolen? How did it get stolen? Do you know who stole it? And how can we get it back? Well, the, the quad, the original one that I used in the Nitro videos, we only had it for two shows on the tour. And we ended up, our second, our first tour date was in, uh, like San Diego, then we deadheaded it to, to El Paso. And then from that point, it was just, you know, a lot of dates in a row. But at the very beginning, you know, we had that day off. So we had, um, at that time, the label was giving us a lot of tour support. You know, we had our own production. We, you know, we had our truck. And, you know, for, for a baby band, as our manager used to call it, you know, we had a, a really huge support. The label really liked us. And, and, 
in all fairness, Jim was just the coolest guy. I like the singer Jim and I really have never had an argument. First, he killed me because he's a black belt in Gracie Jiu Jitsu, but <laughs> he's just a genuinely good dude. And and we always, he's in the good mood. Like, I like to be in a good mood. And, and uh, but what happened is the second show of our tour, we were playing El Paso and all, and we had all the gear loaded up. And now this is clubs. These are clubs. What are you doing? Are you doing a van U Haul? A van are, with a, with, are you doing a van with a U Haul? No, we had a tour there? bus. We had a, a whole tour, tour bus. bus. Okay. So where's equipment in? Is it in a back trailer? Or yeah. Is it in and a we had a 24 foot rider truck with the gear and, and all Shoot, the gear was in the rider a, truck. Real deal. Yeah. That's yeah. We, yeah. The label was really behind us back then. And uh, so, you know, we were traveling in style and, what happened was my guitar took dragons comes. It's like, dude, you know, because we were finished and we had another show that was pretty close, uh, you know, cause you know, Texas, you know, so big, but we yeah. were, our routing was really good. So it was only a couple hours to the next show. I don't remember what city, but so we were just hanging out, you know, talking to some people afterwards, all the gear was loaded. The crew was there, you know, everything was done. And all of a sudden dragon comes in. He's like, dude, you won't believe this. They broke into the rider truck just took my quad and the quad was gone. It's and somewhere. It's it gone. And I'm like, oh man, you but can't, I you can't pawn shop there. that. You cannot. And so it was definitely a, it was definitely a, a, an orchestrated hit because why wouldn't they take anything else except the quad guitar? So it had to have been either a hardcore fan or a very disgruntled girl, uh, you know, back, I don't know. It was, yeah. it was the eighties, but uh, you know, where do you think it is now? Well, what happened and see one of one, somebody just put up a uh, thing. Where are you going to pawn a four neck guitar? That's the question we had. How the hell are you going to, how are you going to sell this thing? Yes. You know? And you so what that? happens is we, we, the next day, cause we had time because the next show wasn't, we, we visited some local pawn shops and, you know, we didn't know, you know, it was too early, but we said, look at, if you see this, you know, this, this is guitar stolen. So we put the word out. Now it was, we didn't have the internet at that time. So we were limited to just going to different places and calling, you know, and then during the tour, we would call like local pawn shops. We got, you know, like a list of a bunch of them. We never found it. And so we surmised that it's probably a collector that took it. Maybe some guy wanted it and it's, you know what I mean? Just who knows, but here's what's wild. Now this was in the late eighties. So we're talking 89, it gets stolen. In 2004, I'm going, I'm touring England and I get an email from a fan and he goes, Mike, you won't believe this. I said, what? He goes, there's a guy that bought the, the top half of your quad uh, because he collects Charvel guitars, you know, the with, top, only Wayne. the top half. Yeah. And he's, and he's bragging that he's got Michelangelo's half of his quad. Now I'm going to London and so I talked to the, and I'm doing a tour of England and uh, among other places in, in like a week or two. So I contacted the promoter there and he arranged, it turns out it was a kid, like a teenager right. and his dad and him collect guitars. So what happened was we arranged and I was, I was livid. I was like, yeah, and then you know, get because this guy. the guy's name was Mick, that Mick Seymour, that, that was uh, the guy that I work with in England. And Mick goes, uh, Michael, uh, they want you to give them 1500 quid uh, for the guitar. That's what they paid for. And I go, I don't want to pay for my own guitar. And I thought about the like, exact Sus. same story. That's crazy. <laughs> you, know, you know, bastards. And, and you know, and I, but I, I thought, okay, 1500 pounds, if I can get my guitar back. So he worked it out. We met and he claimed that he didn't know it was mine, but I do have the proof that he knew it was mine, but I didn't care. You know, I wasn't there to argue with him. I get my guitar back. It was in horrible condition. Uh, I got the two top ones back, but we never got the two bottom ones back. We don't know. There's so the bottom is missing. Yeah. The bottom so of Michelangelo's original. Is it, is it, was it the original quad? Yes. The original wow. one. It had original Kaler seven strings. It was, it was the one in the freight train video, the nitro video, the four neck guitar, the two yeah. top ones were left-handed and the, and I got the back plate of the quad and the back plate of the double returned to me, but the two bottom guitars were never, we never they saw gotta them be somewhere. And, they got to be somewhere. Given the condition of the top two, they were really bad shape. If they might be in a vault in Japan, but they got to be. Some, maybe Rick Nielsen has it in his vault. He's got a <laughs> lot of guitars. I don't yeah. know. But the, yeah. here, I have this funny thing is I have the exact same story of a GMP flying V, uh, Karina. 
of 58 Beautiful. replica that was made for me that uh -huh. got stolen out of Alice Cooper's uh, warehouse. It ended up years, years later being uh, sold to someone in a Canadian music shop. They We found, at this point, the insurance had already been paid out, blah, blah, blah. The guy offered, he goes, look, can if you can buy it back um, if you want from what I paid for it. Um, I'm, I'm making you that offer because now I know it's your guitar. And at that point, I just said, you know what? And he, and he was a fan too. He was a fan of the band. I just said, you know what? You keep it. If I ever really need it, I'll, um, I appreciate you offering that. But if, but if I ever really need it, I'll, I'll ask you for it. But right now that this is yours. Now you already paid for it, you know? And so, cause he didn't know it was stolen when, when it happens. But uh, yeah, that's a crazy story, man. I, but let's find that bottom half of that guitar <laughs> I'd love to. right now. We, we put the word out forever, but you know, you would think with a unique guitar, like, and, and I don't mean to, to drop names. I mean, you know, we work with the people we work with. Please uh, drop I whatever names. Stage. We love, this is a podcast. We need as many sound bites as possible. So drop yeah, all the names you want. You know, it's the way it is, you know. And anyway, I was in upstate New York doing a uh, a workshop. And Joe Bonamas's dad owned a music store up in that area. So we arranged for me and Joe to meet because we had never met. So we meet. It was private, you know, and we were laughing because, I, he uses jazz three picks like I do. And I had Dunlap make, I have my own special color. It says Michelangelo video and they're blue jazz threes. Well, he has ones in gold. So we were comparing our guitar picks and, and he's a really cool dude. And, and he, he was there. Uh, he bought these two Marshall stacks and he's into collecting some, as you know, some like serious vintage guitars. I have about 20 vintage most of my collection are guitars that I have acquired, a lot of USA ones over the years that, that are special to me, where Joe actively right. hunts them out. And, and uh, but we were talking about like, you know, I, I said, Joe, what do you, you know, you're going on stage with 59 Les Pauls, man. You know, you're touring with like the cream of, you know, Stradivarius, you know, not to bring that word up again. But he goes, he goes, yeah, he goes, but you know what? I'm not worried about it. Cause that's what I asked him. Are you worried if somebody steals it? And he said a great thing. He goes, no, because they're so well documented. Where the hell are you going to sell them? You know? And, and that's very true, you know, but um, you know, my quad, it wasn't so much. It was documented. It's so unique. Well, where are you, you going to go? It's documented you know, in that video. But if you, you want know, to check out, if, you, if anybody needs proof and they think they might have some information leading to the uh, recovery of Michael Angelo Badio's bottom half of the quad guitar, go check out the Nitro video, of course, Freight Train, uh, and, and you're going to check out a, an amazing solo because I, I, at this point, we're just a bunch of guitar geeks right now on the podcast, and I'm happy about that because um, I do have some guitar geek questions uh, for us. But first, I just want to... Uh, do a small segment because we have such a supportive cast over here in the live chat and everybody that shows in week in week out on the YouTube official channel, um, hitting that subscribe button and becoming part of our community. We have a thing called fan of the week and I'd like to uh, introduce that right now. What do you say, Vic? Or you have just opened up for Michael Angel Badio and uh, our fans of the week. We call it the fam family of the week. Uh, they've been showing up to all the shows here in the UK this week. Thank you so much, Kai Ross Best, Rachel Ross, and Bill Crow. Look at that family of the week. And if you'd like to be part of the fan of the week, um, all you have to do is just promote this podcast, this episode uh, with Michael Angel Badio and. Um, Find that bottom half of that guitar that's missing over there. And um, what can we say um, more than you've got stuff going on? How, did, how are people going to get in touch with you? How are people going to find Michelangelo? And for those of you listening on the auto broadcast, we can put up those links right now. What do you say, Vic? And Michael, can you tell people the best way to find out more about you? Yeah, um, my instructional programs are through Metal Method. Uh, Doug Marks, Speed Kills, everything I've got, I think 12 or 13 uh, programs. And then um, the best way to contact me or see me is through social media. And, you know, you see those blue check marks uh, on Facebook and Instagram, like the verification. So I'm on yep. Instagram. The two main ones that I use are Instagram and I have an official Facebook page. And then uh, 
you know, I'm the Sawtooth Guitars, the, the company I'm with, we we do stuff on uh, like, like other social media things, you know, like, uh, you know, Snapchat, things like that. But my two main ones are, and also my YouTube page, which is, again, Michelangelo Badio, but I usually put the official on there uh, just so people know. And, and, you know, that check mark is, you know, when you see that blue check mark verification, then you know it's the real deal. There you go. And that's the best way to get in touch with you. What, um, any plans right now to do some live shows or live, any, you know, I know you don't do clinics as much anymore, but do you have any live appearances scheduled coming up? Yeah. In fact, I, I had to, you know, you're in Europe right now. Um, I had several tours for, because of COVID cancel and, you know, the average tour, you know, somewhere 30 plus shows, somewhere around that number, but I had a, about a 30 city tour in Europe that I had had to cancel because it was it came right at the beginning of the Ukraine conflict. Oh, I and I, I was doing shows in Poland, you know, Lithuania was really close in that central Europe area. And, and so, um, you know, we're going to reschedule that tour for uh, either later this year, maybe early next year. But, I, you know, I love to tour. And, uh, you know, just COVID and things have just changed that. But also I, um, what I what we do now is I, I'm very lucky because I'm not in a band per se. And it's freed me to do a lot of projects. For example, with Sawtooth, um, the three main spokesmen are me on guitars, Rudy Sarzo on bass, Minnie Apice on drums. So we got that would be a great band right there. Together. That would be a, a, I, I could see that as being a great band right there. It would it was fun. I mean, Rudy actually played on a tribute to Randy. He played on one of my solo albums and he did. He's awesome. A great guy. But I mean, I, you know, his credentials speak for themselves. And of course, Vinny, you know, when you play Rainbow in the Dark with the guy who played Rainbow in the Dark, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just the sound of his drums. Well, it's like playing with Glenn, you know, so yeah. I mean, these are world class drummers. And, you know, so there's just that groove that they do that it just separates them from from the other from the pack. But and then we got a young singer named Melody from an up and coming band called Liliac. And she's in her early 20s and really an old soul. She's like the female version of Dio and, and she's awesome. So she was the vocalist. So that's one project I did. And then um, we we I base a lot of things now. Um, around the company Sawtooth. Like I have a, a band that when I go to California in a couple of days, uh, we're, we're going to be rehearsing. We were filming videos and we're, we're going to play, you know, locally around LA. Um, okay. One of the owners, uh, uh, his brother is a booking agent out there. So we're going to play the West coast. And then, you know, I, I do, uh, you know, and, and I do my own tours, but I'm, I, I've toured so much. I, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing now. It's like working on guitar designs uh, we play the occasional shows and it's a lot of content online. We're doing acoustic songs with cajones. Uh, mm -hmm. We released, we just filmed five of them about a month ago and we're going to do a whole series. So I'll have about 15 acoustic songs. We're going to have a, we have a set out with, uh, with Vinny and Rudy and myself and the girl Melody that's out. And then we're going to do a bunch of stuff with the band and play. So it's really Sounds like busy. you are nonstop and I, that's I, good. And, and, and check out all those links that we put up before folks to check out uh, Michael uh, Angelo Abadio. And of course, Instagram is where, you know, I reached out to you and you were so graciously accepted to be on this podcast. Um, there they are again. Um, there's one just, I saw it earlier and I wanted to say thank you very much. It's a uh, roomie over here that had a, uh, Thanks again for contributing to the podcast and keeping us uh, funded up. Um, but it's a guitar key question, Michael. Um, and you were talking about Mark Tremonti earlier, but I read that you gave tips to Mark Tremonti about using a tube screamer. What is the approaches of the tube screamer? Now we're getting a little bit geeky with those Ibanez tube screamers and effects, but is, is that true? Well, yeah. Uh, and one of the things about Mark now, <clears throat> this is something that, you know, here is a number one hit songwriter. I have the, I, I like Mark just personally so much and the respect his ability. He, you know, coming from Creed, that was the era of no solos. Now, Alter Bridge, now he told me that Alter Bridge is like the bridge between alternative music and, and ripping guitar. He really wanted to bring solos back. Uh, this is what he told me back in the day when Alter Bridge first started. He didn't really one of the things that I talked to him about is where effects go. 
you know, like where does, does a delay go on the signal chain or does it go in the effects loop? Now, if you use overdrive, the delay should be through your effects loop. Um, always, you don't wanna... Yeah, it sounds better. It sounds a little bit, uh, it sounds like it's kind of in the, you know, in the mix a bit more when it's in your effects yes, loop, right? Exactly. You know, because you, you know, if you put a digital delay through distortion, it's going to sound terrible in the <laughs> signal chain. So it was stuff like that. But, but the Tube Screamer, way back in the day, I was in New Zealand. This is in the early 90s touring. And I found an 80s Tube Screamer. I paid like 200 bucks for it. And this was like the holy grail yeah. uh, of, two, of sounds. I keep it in my studio. It still works. Um, I've never taken it on the road. But... I there's and I can even tell you the frequency that that mm. it's 1k. What I learned over the years, like Dimebag had that he had the smiley face, he had the scoop. You, yeah, I have the sad face. I don't <laughs> like too much low end or too much high end. I like these mids. Um, it, it just it makes it real, and especially the frequency of 1k. If you just go to an equalizer and just bump up 1k, that's what a tube screamer has in abundance and it's got this high-end sustain these ts9s to me were magical and so i have like 10 of them because i stomp on them so hard they break so i would just and i don't endorse the company so i just buy them but i i was telling mark um about why i like these tube screamers and then i had my own signature overdrive to a company called t-rex at the time and he used to use the t-rex overdrive he said nice. it, it was very similar but I look for this bump in the 1K area and you can hear it. You know, I'm no frequency expert. I'm really not. Uh, I just took some engineering classes and I learned like, you know, like a SM57 has got about a five or 6K bump. You know, it's that higher mids. So oh, I'm going know, down that rabbit hole, folks. We are going down that rabbit hole. I like it. <laughs> yeah. You, but, you know, you know, because you have to know your own sound. I mean, if you don't mm -hmm. know, like Steve Vai's always got a sound. He, it's Steve. You can always tell Steve by sound. And so my sound is very mid midi and it gets that like kind of, but that's what I like. And, and, uh, and so I, but so that's what I was telling Mark, you know, it was how right that, around the, the one K mark where you were yeah, talking about. But, so and, I have a signature overdrive, but it's, it, I, it emulates, it sounds beautiful. Uh, I, I, there are these little nano pedals. I've got one right here. Hang on. And it's Rummy, like, I hope you uh, appreciate like this, uh, this big question. <laughs> this, oh, it does. And, nice. and it's got a bar there because I usually wear like big motorcycle shoes, but it's <laughs> from Tom's Line Engineering. You can get it online for like 40 bucks. This sounds as good as my best tube screamers. I don't I know it. how they did it. I don't even care. But it's got that bump at that 1K that just smooths out the, the overdrive and, and gives you that round tone that I personally like. And, and so uh, that's that's what I did. And that's what I told Mark. And see, Mark's such a great musician. You know, now he developed his own sound. So now he has his own overdrives. But, you know, it was the idea of where to put what in the signal chain. You know, and he likes to use a wah a lot, which I'm, I love him, but I'm not, I've never, it's not part of my style that much to use it. I use it a little more nowadays. You but, can, um, you can I, definitely overuse a wah. You can over wah. I think so. And, you, you know, when you find that sweet mid-range spot, it gets a little overkill, some, in my humble opinion. And, and so, so I, I try to, I don't use it as much, but I still love them. You know, there's always a use for it. Do you think you'll ever go past four guitar necks? I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I guess the next thing is a dial guitar. Cause that one question just came up like, when's the five neck coming up? But I mean, I, I, I do believe that Rick Nielsen has us all beat on how he's many got is that? six is i think on? five or it, six yeah. yeah yeah he's got five or six yeah <laughs> you know that the biggest difference ryan with the doubles is it's truly left-handed that's the you know and i i'll say it again when you think of the double guitars that i play play a right-handed piano and then take every key and reverse it so when you when you're playing in unison you're going do re mi fa so la if so you have to play like this to play in unison if I play like this, like, like a normal piano or like see Jordan Rudis, you know, doing dream theater with, a, you know, multiple keyboards. Uh, that's not what this double's about. That's a guitar. That's Jimmy Page doubles. You have to reverse every key 
And then that's what this is like. So it's not hard. It's not cooler or better. It's just, I just wanted to be different. I just, but that's why I just feel that there's a little bit of Rain Man going on with you because I can barely even, <laughs> I can barely even do that. And, <laughs> and you've got, I mean, have you ever taught a course on how to play a quad guitar? Well, not the quad, but the double. I, I took on, um, and we, we did a crowdfunding thing, you know, and I was real successful. And I've only done it once. Uh, well, actually, we did it twice. And, and uh, but one was not just me. But for myself, I did one. And I met a student, a young guy named Philip from from the French part of Canada. He this is like I, I worked with him because I really love this story. He got into a horrific car accident. Mm. And his hand almost went through the steering wheel. Can you imagine the force of that? Yes. And, and he was a really good death metal guitar, you know, like doing down picks, you know, 250 BPO. He was a great death metal right-handed guitarist. He lost the ability to play right-handed, but he found he could hold a pick and play lefty. And so I taught him, you know, online, I taught him how to play left-handed. And because he, he sought me out. And we talk and I don't like us, like you said, and I, I don't teach privately really at all. And, right. and uh, you know, but he was something special and he had the work ethic. So I work with him on it and he couldn't do anything, but I showed him hand positioning, how, what, he, what he needed to look for the way there's two disciplines of pick. You, you either keep your hand off the fretboard and there's a lot of uh, examples. Al Miola is one. Joe Bonamassa does that a lot too. Or you, you're like me and John Petrucci. You, you keep your fingers. You off. anchor it. You almost Pardon? anchor it. You either an you anchor it. Yeah. Exactly. You anchor or you do not. And then some people like Joe Bonamo say does a little bit of both. And I think all of us do a little bit of both. Yeah. So, um, but Philip had this non-anchoring, just free floating mechanism, which is really good. And so I showed him, and then he ended up like he's in a band now. You know, they're getting signed and. Uh, you know, so and uh, it, it, he's a great, but he's a real success story. I mean, when you think you've had a bad day, it wasn't bad enough to put your hand through a <laughs> steering wheel in an accident. And so, you know, and, and but he was an inspiration to me. It was like, and now he's got a double. He's working all this cool stuff. I'm like, yes, <laughs> I love well, it. Well, I mean, if that didn't qualify you for being one of the uh, forefathers of shred guitar, then and passing on the knowledge to uh, someone that actually really, really uh, came to, you know, that knowledge came for him at such a good point in his life. He needed to have that. You gave it to him. Um, it's been a thrill having, you know, one of the pioneers of shred metal uh, and shred guitar. D d d does that title weird you out or do you accept that title? I mean, do, do, do you feel that the word shred was, is, is, is disparaging or do you feel it as a compliment? Great question. Really? That's it's a great question. I'm a student of music. When, if this was the year 17, whatever, uh, if you wanted to get criticized by a critic, they like in, in a, you know, in a paper or whatever periodicals they had in the day, they would call you a virtuoso because the technical definition of a virtuoso is you're extremely technically proficient at your instrument. That's the Harvard Music Dictionary definition because I have it. Uh, and I, I have a degree in music. It doesn't make me better, but I studied history throughout the ages there are always critics that criticize musicians with extreme technique. So when, you know, in the 80s, I never, we never called each other shredders. That was kind <laughs> of a term afterwards that seemed to hit in the 90s, you know, in the grunge era, where it was a, like a derogatory term. They tried to criticize. But see, for me, I thought about it, you know, because a lot of people didn't want to be known as a shredder. I said to myself, you know what? Forget it. I'm going to embrace this. If you want to call me a shredder, call me it and I'll be proud. Because, <laughs> Lean into it. <laughs> but yeah, be, yeah, own it. Because all I want to do on guitar is be the best that I can be. I, that's all I wanted to do. If that means I'm a shredder, hey, I'll put shred right on the t-shirt. You know, and so <laughs> I embrace the terminology. Shred has made the bread. Yeah, why you. not? You know, I mean, because it, it, it's, you know, 
if that's what, and see now everybody uses like duty shreds, everybody shreds now that yeah. you can't, you can't stop good. You know, people try all the time, but you know, it's like the word virtuoso, you know, Mozart was called a virtuoso. It was a derogatory term. It's like saying he's a mindless shredder and, and you know, the critics criticize, but who remembers the name of the person who said that? But now everybody's ripping on guitar. Yeah, you know, are yeah. they uh, not everybody? But you know, we if somebody's playing bluegrass really fast, it's not duty was shredding that thing, man. You know, it's like common vernacular of of, of today. So exactly. I embrace it, and I make no apologies. <laughs> <laughs> we are not going to make any apologies as well, even though we have gone. Uh, uh, a little bit over time on our podcast, Len, yes, but yes. This, I don't feel like it's over time because I feel like we're just getting started. But you know what? We're going to have you on again at one point um, when we can talk even more uh, guitar geek stuff, which I love talking guitars. And we talk um, about your future projects as well. But uh, it's been a pleasure having you on. It's um, Like I said, for our first conversation, uh, knowing about you all over the years, hearing the legend, hearing the stories and having bandmates and friends all uh, speak highly of you. It's great that, you know, the interview and the conversation lives up to everything that they said and that uh, I was imagining it would be. So thank you so much, Michael, for being on. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. It was amazing. It was great. And, um, you. you know, I usually end with asking our guests if there's um, – maybe guitar advice, but not just guitar advice, life advice that has been handed to you that you might be able to uh, pass on to some of our uh, listeners of the In the Trenches podcast. And by the way, folks, because we have had such an amazing time this week with, with uh, Michelangelo, uh, uh, Badio, we are going to not have a uh, show next week, so we will do an encore presentation of something. So be on your lookout for um, our upcoming guests. But we are, again, on the road here with Alice Cooper here in the UK right now. And I got to go get ready to get, <laughs> to get on stage in just a little bit. Um, but we'll be playing around. Check out AliceCooper.com or better yet, RyanRoxy.com for the tour dates. And of course, again, there's the tour dates that are, that are left on our schedule. And, um, and one last time, we'll put up those contact informations for Michael Angelo Badio. Um, there's his uh, contact information to start following him if you don't already and uh, start following us if you don't already. If you are Michael Angelo fans and you're just tuning into our uh, podcast again, RyanRoxy.com. You want to find out more about the all access pass that's a great but hopefully i've given you a little bit of time michael to think about uh some sort of life advice to pass on to our listeners and is is there anything i do i have i have two things to say and i'm going to keep it short three letters p m a positive mental attitude and two words don't quit there's a rift that you're having a hard time be positive about it and just keep working at it and tell yourself you're going to get it. Picture that you can play it. So I, I live, that's what I live my life. Uh, I, I think of life as your attitude is, it's a coin. PMA on one side, NMA on the other. You're either positive or negative. There's no gray in, in my world of thinking. And I just don't quit. I mean, you know, I've had a lot of things happen to me. You know, parents passing away, my younger sister, a lot of things, you know, in life that hits you. But you just persevere. Don't quit. Think positive. That's it. You have had, it's been really, really great having you on, Michael. That's great. You've had the, you've had the most positive mental attitude throughout the whole entire conversation. I'm sure you're going to go on and have it um, for the rest of the day and on your upcoming trip to LA. So look out for uh, Michelangelo Badio playing somewhere near you in Los Angeles. And of course, follow all his uh, contacts again. So hang on for just one second while we say goodbye to everybody else. But everybody, thank you so much for supporting the podcast and we shall see you next time. I'm I'm Ryan Roxy. Thank you so much, team. Uh, Vic, thanks so much for being a part of it. Federica, thanks so much for being a part of it. All of the RJ, all of the all accessors. My name's Ryan Roxy. Until next time, enjoy the ride. Thank you, Michael. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy.